afternoon, everyone. We, we are live um, on the YouTube stream and the TOS website uh, today. Okay. Um, uh, welcome, uh, committee members, uh, guests, and people watching on the live stream. This is Education, Health, and Environmental Matters Committee. We have uh, two bills this morning, one by Senator Feldman and one by Senator Eckert. Um, let us start with Senator Feldman, and that is Senate Bill 147. He will be followed by uh, Dr. Santi Begat, followed by Kara Purdy, followed by Natasha Begat, followed by Gregory Shuckman. There, there is no opposition. There are, however, some uh, favorable with amendments in written testimony only. So with that, uh, welcome Senator Feldman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just quickly, a little background. Uh, this particular bill, Senate Bill 147, was, is exactly um, the same as a bill that was introduced back in 2018 by former Delegate Aruna Miller and also by Delegate Barve, uh, which passed that year unanimously out of the House of Delegates, uh, 138 to zero. Unfortunately, came to EHE, I think the 28th of March, you know, so it was just a little too late. So uh, I'm, we're putting the bill back in. And just by, by way of a little background, um, we've got millions of Americans, uh, millions of individuals with chronic uh, health conditions. And one of the main problems is we try to assist those individuals is very, very limited uh, data, particularly on young adults. When I say young adults, we're talking ages 18 uh, to 34, who grew up uh, who are or acquired uh, chronic health conditions. And that's why this particular bill is, is so critical. So just a little more data, uh, based on the data we do have, uh, there's about 20 million, 20 million young adults in the United States with chronic conditions, and four young adults have a, a chronic uh, condition. Um, and also there's about 750,000 adolescents with chronic conditions uh, entering adulthood each and every year. And so in an effort to kind of support, I would say, these young adults as they attempt um, Particularly, we're talking about higher ed. You know, the post -sec in the in the secondary or you know, K through 12 world, you know, there are certain um, accommodations that that may be possible. But when you you leave high school and you're in um, you know college, university, grad school, we really have almost no uh, accommodation policies in place for these students, and we really do need to study those needs and make a informed and knowledge-based uh, set of recommendations to enhance their higher education experience. And that's what the task force um, that's contemplated here in Senate Bill 147 um, will do. It'll do just that. So the task force will be jointly overseen by the um, MDH, the Maryland Department of Health, and the Maryland Higher Education Commission. And it, its task primarily would be to make recommendations how to improve the experience of undergrad and graduate students with these chronic uh, health conditions. As you can see from the bill, uh, the members of the, of the task force would include clinical experts, caregivers, students, some representatives some, uh, from institutions of higher ed, and you can look at the bill. Uh, and then the task force would report findings back to the governor and the General Assembly by December 31st, uh, 2022. There are two amendments. Uh, the Maryland Nurses Association, which fully supports the bill with uh, has offered an amendment they'd like um, one of their members to serve on the task force, uh, which is fine with, with me. And the ARC of Maryland uh, wants a small change in, t in the definition of chronic health condition. Currently in the bill, we define it to, to mean physical, behavioral, emotion uh, uh, cond conditions, um, and they would like the word developmental added in um, as an amendment. Those are the only amendments. The only pushback, if you, I would even, not sure I would characterize it as such. If you look at the Ma Maryland Department of Health letter, uh, they say they see the value in the, um, in the task force, but they ask that I reintroduce it in 2022 because the Mar Maryland Department of Health personnel, they say, um, is tied up with COVID, which I totally get. But if you look at the fiscal note, uh, the fiscal note essentially it concludes that this task force could be handled uh, with existing resources. And the reason they say that, number one, they say that at early on, it'll be the Maryland Health uh, Higher Ed um, Commission that will be primarily responsible with staffing uh, with, and they say, 
uh, when they were contacted by the uh, Department of Legislative Services, that they're fully able to handle it with existing uh, resources. Um, and so that, that's one part of it. And also, if you look at the bill, uh, the task force only authorizes um, that it be staffed by MDH in part. Um, it's not required. So if they really are having, uh, again, I, I would say that because of COVID, most of the staffing would come from um, MHEC. But even if that's not uh, the case, uh, the way the bill's written, again, it's only authorizing that, that MDH be staffed, doesn't require it. So I think for those reasons, this very minor concern expressed by MDH, I think is largely undercut by the uh, fiscal notes, specifically if you look at the uh, page two under state expenditures, because they contacted both uh, MHEC and MDH. So, um, Mr. Chair, that's really all I have. Uh, uh, Dr. Baggett will expand a little more fully on why the task force is so needed. And then you'll, you'll actually hear from two young students um, share their personal experiences with you. But with that said, I'd ask uh, the, the, um, the committee with those two amendments uh, for a favorable report on Senate Bill uh, 147. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Feldman. Uh, we will take questions for the Senator and then we'll hear from the four speakers, hold our questions till the panel is done and then we'll do a second round of questions. Uh, before I call on Senator Riley, let me ask you a question. Uh, under the, the description of the task force, it says, obtain and study existing data as publicly available. And I guess my question is, obviously a lot of personal health issues are covered by HIPAA. And I don't know how much data is readily available. And sort of in your description, you acknowledge what's publicly available. Has anybody done a preliminary review to see if there is much data given that collecting that must be complicated? You know, I might defer because our witness, Dr. Bat, is, is a doctor, a medical doctor, and she may have a little more information on what's okay. out there. She runs an organization. I, so I'd rather uh, stay in my lane and, and maybe defer to her expertise on that one, uh, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, I have Senator Riley followed by Senator Ellis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Brian, it's good to see you again. Uh, good to see you. About eight years ago, we uh, developed uh, through EHE a longevity study program analyzing students. Do you know if this uh, mental, physical, and developmental disability was part of that longevity uh, study? And Mr. Chairman, you may know uh, better than uh, Brian on that longevity data center. Well, uh, Senator Riley, I, honestly, I, I do not know the answer to that. I do not. Okay. I would say also, uh, Mr. Chairman, on the existing resources, I mean, to the, back on this issue of the, you know, the staffing uh, requirements, I mean, there's a lot of this is public, you know, information. So it's, it's you know, in terms of when we think of staffing a task force and, and all that, I'm, I think that also cuts down to some extent on like what's really involved. Although, as I said, I think it's mainly MHEC would do the early heavy lifting and they say they're capable of doing that research on what's out there, existing data. But the HIPAA issue, that, that's one I'll, again, I'll defer to on my panel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Ellis, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Thank you, Senator Feldman, for this bill. Um, good to see you. I have a, a question based on the Americans with Disabilities Act. So that's out there, it's been out there for a while. All our higher educational institutions have disability services. They go by various names on different campuses. My two children went through University of Maryland and UMBC, College Park and UMBC, and you know, being involved um, with uh, parent organizations on those campuses. And I've kind of heard a lot about those uh, services on all campus. And so this is, why is this bill necessary when we have ADA and we have these campus services there who are taking care of anyone with uh, disabilities? Uh, is this a kind of mission that uh, something is not really is that going right or is not as comprehensive as far as reaching out to as many students as possible? Well, first of all, this, you know, when we talk about chronic con health conditions, they, I think, fall within a lot of the gaps here. You're talking about, you know, 
the ADA is specifically in terms of definitions. Um, you know, I think again, the doctor I think could speak to that. She runs a whole organization talking about the lack of accommodation policies when it comes to this particular population, which is not necessarily at all covered by ADA. Uh, talk about chronic medical conditions. So I think this is trying to get at a, um, a population that is sort of, again, falls, there's a void in terms of policies, laws, and the rest. And, and, and we're trying to fill this gap up. Like the University of Maryland, for example, I think it's, um, I think it's in the current, in the fiscal note mentions, I mean, they, they don't have any policy. I'm reading specifically uh, from the fiscal notes as University System of Maryland does not have a policy specifically addressing the accommodations of students with chronic health conditions. So um, that's the point is, you know, there are laws in place, generally ADA, but this is a population that's somewhere, um, you know, not covered there and as the fiscal note points out. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I'll follow up with the doctor when she uh, testify about you know, what might be falling through the gaps when it comes to disability versus chronic health. So thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Uh, before I move on, uh, Senator Feldman, you said that the Nurses Association, uh, adding them was fine with you, and then you mentioned the ARC uh, amendment. Uh, right. Is that something you are fine with or not? Yeah, yes, yeah, I'm totally fine. I, I mean, they submitted, uh, There should you should have written testimony from both. We do. And uh, I mean, I, obviously, it's in the possession of the committee. I mean, I'm I'm fine with those adjustments, but obviously, it's up to the committee. Okay, that's great. Um, then we're going. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Senator Kagan, Vice Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Feldman, just a quick question: In looking at who's on the commission, is there any wisdom to having a representative who can bring wisdom from K to 12? What sort of um, challenges and opportunities folks have gotten, students have gotten prior to going to higher education? Because I suspect there's a patchwork quilt among the 24 jurisdictions. Yeah, I think that's, I, look, that, I would consider that a friendly uh, amendment. That sounds like a great idea. I mean, I, again, I'll, maybe I'll defer to the experts. I think that makes complete sense, total sense. Okay, thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Simon Ayer. Thank you, nice to see you, Senator Feldman. Okay. Uh, just a quick question um, on the scope. Um, the school population is a subset of that population. So I guess if you're looking at the issue, why are you just uh, limiting it to students? Well, uh, you know, I, I, I think that's who I think, you know, we're looking at a popular, so who, what are you envisioning? I mean, just so I'm understanding fully your question. Well, I mean, you're saying a about lot of people don't go to higher education. They go straight into career and they still have these health conditions. So I was just curious if there's something special that you're trying to get via students or are you trying, was it intentional not to get the whole population? No, but I mean, I, you know, I think when you're talking about in, policies that may impact the private workplace. I mean, that seems to me a whole different set of issues and pushbacks from, I mean, if you, are you talking about private businesses that would be subject to policies and laws, you know, for, I mean, look, I think that may be, um, you know, not a bad idea. I don't want to chop off too, too broad a, you know, honestly, like serving on the finance committee, I, you know, I know that if you're going to start uh, dictating policies, accommodation, or otherwise to, to the business community, then, you know, that's a whole separate kind of a thing. This is a, we were talking about students, grad students, undergrad students. I think this, you know, it's a more targeted population of young adults. So um, I'm not saying there's not value to what you say, but this is, you know, again, I'm just borrowing a, a bill that a task force that was actually passed in 18. I didn't want to, you know, broaden it, make it more complicated than necessary, but obviously the committee can broaden it out if you know if it's the will of the committee right and this is a friendly question i'm, I'm not yeah, yeah i don't I mean, have one way or the other but I, I guess i don't know what the recommendations are coming out so do you anticipate the recommendations of this task force to be solely focused on the the students who are in school and try to help them uh, well that's, which makes that's the, the intent i mean the yeah i mean the intent there is we're drawing i think senator kagan keyed in on we have some policies in place K through 12, but when you leave, you know, to go post-secondary, these kids are on their own. There's like nothing. And as Senator Ellis pointed out the ADA, but again, this is 
sort of in a, an area where that we have no policies. And I think this task force would focus on, on that. But again, if you want to make it a broader, uh, you know, I, I certainly have, like you said, that's, that's a friendly line of questioning. Just want to be realistic about what the task force can do and achieve. Right. So, I mean, and I'll leave it at this. I, I think if we're going to go down this road and we say we want to help people that have uh, chronic health issues in this age range, um, I would think we want to help all Marylanders in that age range and not just say we're going to help students who have these issues. Somebody may have similar issues outside of a school. So well, you know, we creating yeah, a task force, maybe the recommendations sure. don't have to address all that, but they could at least bring back okay. information to us. Yeah, I think that's fair. And as I say, the doctor runs a whole organization on this topic. She probably could speak to, you know, exactly your point. And if, if she, th you know, again, the committee can broaden it out however it sees fit. But uh, I try to keep it a little bit more targeted here. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And, we, and also, I'd say out the staffing, I mean, we're picking Department of Health and MHEC, which is, you know, our higher ed commission to staff this. So for the higher ed commission to be staffing, you know, task force for recommendations that go beyond higher ed, you know, that, so I'm, again, trying to keep it tight here, but. Um. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, we're gonna get our first witness, uh, Dr. Uh, Santi uh, Baggett, please, doctor. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairman Penske and committee. Thank you for hearing my testimony today. Senator Feldman, thank you for being a champion for young people with chronic conditions and sponsoring this bill. So I'm Santi Bagat. I'm a physician and a mother of a young adult who grew up with a chronic health condition. I founded Physician Parent Caregivers, a voluntary nonprofit dedicated to quality health care and quality of life for an estimated 20 million young Americans with chronic conditions. Historically, historically overlooked and ignored, they call themselves Young Invisibles. Last year, we launched a young adult movement called Invisible Wave that advocates for their health and civil rights. In 2018, former delegate Aruna Miller first introduced this bill and it passed the House of Delegates unanimously. Um, time precluded a vote in the Senate. And as uh, Senator Feldman said, the fiscal policy note highlighted that the University System of Maryland does not have any policies specific um, to students with chronic conditions. This is a critical finding. Disability accommodations are presumed to address the academic needs of these young people, but chronic conditions are episodic and unpredictable. Yes, it's difficult for professors to accommodate, but I can assure you that none of us can imagine how difficult it is for young invisibles. You may be wondering why this population is invisible and overlooked. Advances in medicine and technology now enable over 90% of teens with chronic conditions to survive into adulthood. It is a miracle the world did not expect. As a result, adult medicine, higher education, government and society, did not prepare to receive these young people, and they exist now in every community. At least one in four young adults grows up with a childhood condition, and many more develop them in young adulthood. COVID-19 is highlighting disparities that young invisibles face. A recent analysis showed that they're extremely high risk of COVID-related deaths, 13 times higher than their healthy peers. Senator Chris Van Hollen and Judy Woodruff spoke at our summit in December on the urgent need to address young invisibles. The Senator has written letters, two letters to the CDC asking them to assess the risk designation and to prioritize them for vaccinations. He is most concerned about college students with chronic conditions. Colleges need to identify, track and support their students with chronic conditions. They need to have policies, programs and services to ensure their students stay in good health, learn and grow. Since data are lacking on the prevalence, supports and outcomes, we are in the dark. In the face of this COVID pandemic, how are colleges informing and protecting their students with chronic conditions? How can they help them get vaccinated? I'd like to refer to two articles about college health centers. The first is a Washington Post investigative report that was prompted by Olivia Paragall's death at the University of Maryland. This report shows that many colleges have numerous incidents of morbidity and mortality when students experience acute or chronic illnesses. Another is an article in the Journal of Pediatrics that says most college health centers are capable of providing primary care for students with chronic conditions. Clearly, this is an urgent unmet need that is affecting millions of students across the country. 
Just like other students, Young Invisibles are in a vulnerable life phase. Many students could be in place to help them stay on track and graduate, but they are not. So these students often suffer, get poor grades or drop out. Bill Gates has pointed out that the US has an extremely high dropout rate. 45% of students um, drop out or withdraw for a period of time. We need to know how many are young invisibles. College graduates earn as much as 65% more than high school graduates. And this is so important for young invisibles who have exorbitant medical bills and are at high risk for medical bankruptcy that can ruin their lives. Education is also the most important factor in being able to make sound healthcare decisions an undeniable need for young invisibles. We must confront the critical 21st century issue of young adult health. We need to address this population as a single age demographic that has common needs, not by physical or mental health conditions and not by a specific condition. This is not just about health and educational equity. We have a moral imperative to treat young invisibles as equal to everyone else and give them the opportunity to be in optimal health and succeed in higher education but this is not happening. Students with chronic physical health conditions are not included in policies such as the Congress College Affordability Act that includes programs, assistance, and data for mental health, disabilities, and intellectual disabilities. It's time we correct these tragic oversights and our ongoing negligence. I thank you for considering this bill. It's the first of its kind as far as we know, and it would provide us with the first essential picture we have of college students with chronic conditions. Thank you, Dr. Baggett. Um, let's go to Ms. Purdy, please. Thank you everyone for uh, having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Kara Purdy. I'm a lifelong Maryland resident and member of the Invisible Wave, a group of, a group of young adults with chronic conditions trying to spread awareness of our healthcare and social needs in the world. I'd like to use my time to give a brief background of my chronic illness and confront the discrepancy of university disability accommodations with accommodations available in the workplace. I have a rare congenital connective tissue disorder called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. The symptoms of this disease include chronic pain, brain fog, heart issues, frequent joint dislocations, and chronic fatigue. As I grew up, my symptoms got progressively worse. During flare-ups of the disease, I had an extremely difficult time having energy to do the most basic tasks. I was diagnosed at 21 years old, a college senior, after seeing more than 10 different specialist doctors. After high school, I went to the University of Maryland to study bioengineering in the Honors College. Without an official diagnosis for what I was going through, I was not able to receive any accommodations to the university. I was frequently unable to go to class due to chronic fatigue and my GPA suffered. Unfortunately, even after my diagnosis, I learned that the university accessibility and disability services do not provide accommodations for periodic absence, and I was left to plead with my teachers for their pity. After college, working in healthcare, I applied for and received intermittent FMLA after a year of employment, which meant I could call out of work for periods of incapacitation without punishment or question by my employer. Anyone who has gone to UMD knows that there are strict policies regarding attendance. Per university policy, students are given one opportunity a semester to use a self-signed absence note to get out of class. Past that, you'll have to negotiate with your professors for their sympathy. The University Health Center is also notoriously averse to giving out absence notes. I came down with mononucleosis as a junior and was told to take it easy for a couple weeks, but was not given any excuse note for class. I was expected to power through the fever, chills, fatigue, and body aches and continue with my studies without break. Whereas if I got sick in the workplace, I would just use sick time to help take care of myself at home. The college experience is supposed to provide students with a well-rounded education and shape people for their lives in the workplace. If that's so, then why are the university disability services so different than what's available in the real world? Why does a student's health and recovery come second to attending a lecture that could be video recorded? We need to revise the abilities and focus of the University Health Center and Disability Services to more accurately focus on the unique health needs of the individual. Thank you, uh, Ms. Purdy. Thank you very much for respecting the time limits. Uh, well, let's go to um, Natasha Baggett, followed by Gregory Shuckman, please. Ms. Baggett, can you unmute? Or Ms. Stanton, can you help her? There you go. I'm sorry. That's okay. I'm a young invisible 
It's a name we young adults with chronic conditions call ourselves because the world doesn't see us. I have uncontrolled epilepsy, which means I have seizures that are unpredictable and dangerous, but my medical condition doesn't define me. I love dance, music, and art. I'm a second degree black belt, and I know what it takes to accomplish goals. Like every other student, I went to college dreaming that I would get a degree, make friends, and find a mate. But something else came first, my health condition. The time and energy I had to devote to my health did not leave room for both academics and a social life. I had to choose between them and I chose my studies. I worked very hard and I was named to the Dean's List with the 3.8 GPA. But the university made it harder and harder for me to succeed. The Campus Health Center didn't help me. Instead, I was sent to the security to give them my information in case I had a seizure. What kind of message did that give me? Am I a security risk, not a human being with a health condition? I had disability accommodations, but that failed to address my chronic and unpredictable health needs. Every semester, I met, my, I met with my uh, professors to explain my situation. When they refused to work with me, I, I got anxious and stressed, and that made my seizures much worse. I affected, it affected my performance and attendance. At one point, my professor gave me an incomplete for two semesters. And without even telling him, the administration gave me an F. I was devastated. I have never gotten an F in my entire life. My health suffered and I had to take medical leave. Last year, I decided that I would not go back because I have had been through too much traumatic history. My hope today is that my difficult experience will help wake people up and bring about change. Young Invisibles need the college experience just as much as anybody else. Colleges could help us grow and graduate, but that is not happening which leaves young people like me to ask, why are they ignoring us? Thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Baggett, and sorry for your um, traumatic situations that you've had to face, uh, but thank you for your great testimony. Uh, let's go to Gregory, uh, Gregory uh, Shuckman, please. Yes, good morning. Chairman Pinsky, Vice Chair Kagan. Members of the Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs Committee, thank you for allowing me to testify this morning in support of S-147, which would establish a task force that will look at how we can best serve students who live with chronic conditions in our state's colleges and universities. Uh, may I also say good morning to my state senator, Senator Katie Fry Hester, and to my friend, Senator Lamb. Um, as a former MHEC commissioner under Governor O'Malley, who was co-chair of the 2013-2017 state plan for higher education, and as someone who's worked in higher education for over 20 years, I have firsthand experience working with our colleges and universities in Maryland. As someone who has been living with multiple sclerosis for 20 years, um, and who is the past chair of the Greater Washington DC Maryland chapter of the National MS Society, uh, I can certainly relate to people who have chronic health conditions. And as a six year doctoral student at the University of Florida, I think I check all the boxes for the target population in this legislation. Um, you may think that Senator Feldman brought in a ringer uh, for his bill, but I assure you that we have not spoken before. 
I should um, point out that I am a current appointee of Governor Hogan's to the Maryland Education Council, which is the body that represents our state before the Education Commission of the States. Um, I'm pleased that President Ferguson is also a commissioner and look forward to working with him at ECS. With respect to building an awareness and understanding of people who live with chronic health conditions and the challenges that they face in higher education, according to the National Center for College Students with Disabilities, 19% of undergraduates in our nation have some form of disability. When we look at attainment rates, the Census Bureau reports that people with disabilities nationally have baccalaureate attainment rates at less than half as much as those who do not have a disability. It's 20.4% versus 42.8%. If you add students who have some college or an associate's degree to that attainment rate, students with disabilities are still below 50%. And since Maryland has a college attainment goal of 55% by 2025, we cannot afford to leave any group of students behind. So finding ways that will increase attainment rates for students with chronic health conditions is essential if we're going to reach that goal. Uh, I agree with you, Mr. Chairman, that there are significant issues with identifying students with chronic health conditions, particularly with HIPAA, and the fact that students with chronic health conditions offer suffer from stigma and may not want to disclose their illness. Um, our colleges and universities do not have a mechanism for collecting this information, nor do institutions receive additional funding to provide the necessary supports and services uh, to students with disabilities, so there will be costs to our colleges, universities to provide these services um, if we want to make these students successful. Thank and I you. know that, if I'm you sorry. Can, uh, wrap up, Mr. Shuckman, we're under a bit of a time constraint given the inauguration at uh, noon. And I am excited to go to that inauguration, Mr. Chairman, so I will stop there. Great. Um, it's uh, now 1133. We have one other bill with three witnesses. Are there any questions for any of the uh, witnesses on Senator Feldman's bill? seeing none and there is no opposition. The rest is written with amendments which uh, the Senator has uh, addressed. Uh, that'll conclude the hearing on Senate Bill 147. Thank you all witnesses and uh, best of luck, uh, particularly Ms. Baggett uh, going forward in terms of uh, taking care of yourself. Okay, we're moving on to 161, Senator Eckert, task force to study access to mental health care in higher education somewhat of a overlap. Uh, we have Senator Eckert, followed by um, Emma Content, followed by Margot Quinlan, followed by Allison Taylor. And I can tell you once again, um, there is no opposition, oral or written. There may be, I see at least one amendment in the written testimony, uh, more than one. Um, uh, but there is no opposition. So we'll start, uh, welcome uh, Senator Eckert. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Madam Vice Chair, uh, Senator Addy Eckert here today, testimony for Senate Bill 161, which is a cross file for a House Bill 244. As you said, Mr. Chairman, you've heard this bill before. It is very similar to the bill you heard uh, in the previous half hour. But again, more than ever, there is a need to be able to take a look at access to healthcare and um, mental health care, particularly for our students as they transition from high school into um, the higher ed arena. And I'm just going to share real quickly, I had the opportunity, to, as you know, to work school health nurse in the Dorchester County School System. And I also did some work with our mental health team. So I would do the assessments and then I would make those uh, recommendations to the next therapist. And over about seven or eight years, um, that program worked with a series of students with very complex mental health issues who had started in junior high or middle school. They followed them all the way to high school and providing a support group. Those same uh, one student also was involved with our community rehab program, um, which provides PRP services in the community and wound up being the um, head of his football team. He was the uh, lead player, won a scholarship, and was off to college. Unfortunately, when he went off to college, there were not the kind of transition and supportive services when he went to the college, and he wound up dropping out within the first three months and came back home and stayed home for a while. 
I share that with you because it's typical of many students who find themselves in a situation where they have been receiving a lot of supports, but then aren't able to access those same kind of supports as they go into higher ed. So for that reason, and I could give you several others, I think it's really important that we take a look at this. I know the department has said it's gonna be hard to do that this year, um, but please take that into consideration. Suicide is still a very live and major issue across our country with our young people and COVID has only exacerbated a lot of anxiety and depression. So it would be good to take a look what's in place, what works, what doesn't work, what kind of recommendations can we make and how do we uh, deal with the barriers with access to care so we can have productive students and entering the workplace with the kind of supports that they need. There are several amendments. I would encourage that we add those additional members to the task force if it's in your best interest and the people of Maryland's best interest to move this forward, which I would encourage. And I also believe that there needs to be the amendment that I think has been offered by Dr. Zeller. Um, the insurance commissioner certainly would be a welcomed asset to the team. We've worked with her on the Behavioral Health Commission. And uh, with that, I urge you favorable passage of this initiative. Thank you. Uh, we have two witnesses, not three. So we're gonna take those two witnesses, then we'll ask questions of the sponsor and the witnesses. And um, as Senator Eckert said, it, it does affect a lot of people. One of our own family, former state Senator Jamie Raskin lost uh, his son, Tommy um, in college uh, just uh, two weeks ago. Um, Okay, with that, let's go to uh, Ms. Content. Thank you very much. My name is Emma Content. I'm a 2019 graduate of St. Mary's College of Maryland. Um, I've testified twice before on behalf of students at SMCM in regards to mental health care access. Uh, thank you for letting me speak today. I spent five years at SMCM while pursuing my degree in political science. The professors in the department are some of the best in the entire college, and I'm still in contact with them as I pursue my further, further education and my master's. I've made a lot of friends at SMCM, and the education I've received is really has really opened my eyes to the world and allowed me to chase new experiences in my career field. Overall, I did enjoy my time at SMCM. However, my and my fellow students' experiences could have been made much better by timely, accessible options for mental health care. To give you an idea of the facilities at SMCM, the Wellness Center only offers four counselors, counselors, not therapists, for close to 2,500 students. Of these, there is only one full-time staff member. There's one psychiatrist who appears once a week for several hours and takes up to five weeks to schedule with, no matter how urgent the issue. The Wellness Center is not open on weekends past 5 p.m is not open on weekends or past 5 p.m. during the week. Walk-in hours are available for two hours a day during which regular appointments are scheduled with therapists, rendering them essentially unusable. The nearest hospital is 45 minutes away and has been proposed by the Dean as an accessible option when it should be a last result for students in only the most dire of circumstances. In my time at SMCM, I've watched students be denied medications, be prescribed medication out of their healthcare plan or beyond their price range, fail classes and have to withdraw, have breakdowns in the lobby of the wellness center due to canceled appointments resulting from understaffing, and in some cases, unfortunately, try to commit suicide. I watched my own grade slip due to inadequate mental health care um, in my junior year and received a concussion from hyperventilating during a panic attack and passing out. I cracked my head on a desk on the way down and still have issues from that concussion to this day. To be fair, the situation at SMCM is much better compared to larger campuses like UMD and UMBC, where students have actually taken their lives related to the same issue. To me, this is a tragic symptom of our larger healthcare network being unequipped to deal with the mental health care needs of students. Students in higher education are one of the most vulnerable populations of this, as we're in a unique position in our lives of both mental, emotional, and financial change. 
my, my fellow students experience at SMCM is merely one example of a much larger issue that needs to be addressed, not only for students, but for residents across Maryland. And for that reason, I urge the passage of this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Uh, content. Um, let's go to Ms. Quinlan, uh, Margo Quinlan from MHA. Great, yeah, thank you, Chair Pinsky and members of this committee. My name is Margo Quinlan. I'm the Director of Youth and Older Adult Policy at the Mental Health Association of Maryland. Uh, and we, again, appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of this bill. Um, as has already been said, uh, this, um, you know, great number of students are experiencing depression and mental health issues. Um, reports show that one in four Americans struggle with diagnosable mental health problems, many of which arise at ages 18 to 24. Um, and recent studies show that only around 15% of students who report experiencing depression or anxiety ever make it to their college campus counseling centers, um, which we think really highlights the need to reevaluate the service delivery models here in Maryland. And as Senator Eckhart um, shared, the COVID-19 pandemic has also really intensified this need. Um, and students in higher education are facing increased challenges in accessing mental health care, increased instances of experiencing or witnessing race-based discrimination as a result of the pandemic, um, and increasing reports of anxiety and depression negatively impacting uh, their academic performance. Um, we think that the fact that the bill mandates that the task force make recommendations around the use of telemedicine and video conferencing um, really has the potential to reduce barriers to accessing mental health care for our students now in these current circumstances um, and going into the future. Um, we would also really urge this committee to um, consider and adopt the amendments proposed by Eileen Zeller in her written testimony, um, which would have the task force more explicitly address um, evidence-based practices for treating um, students at risk for suicide. Uh, we at the Mental Health Association believe that it's vital that we have the appropriate services and mental health care models on campuses across our state in order to meet the diverse needs of our students and would urge a favorable report on this bill. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Ms. Quinlan. Um, we're going to questions. Um, Senator Riley. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Ecker, is this a task force that would study both public as well as private uh, colleges and universities? Oh, that's a that's a very good point. I don't think it's specified in the bill, but we could certainly make that distinction. And I share with you why the story I told you that young man went to a public university, but I've also worked with one of the private universities at the request of the students because of the situation I think that Miss Emma was talking about. Okay, I'm not advocating one or the other. I, I guess the question is for clarification. If you want both of them, uh, I don't think you have to say anything, but if you prefer just to work with public universities and colleges, that's fine too. I just want to clarify that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Um, further questions on this legislation, Senate Bill 161, seeing none, uh, that completes the two bills we'll hear during the first session. Um, I want to thank everybody for testifying, being attuned and involved and engaged. Um, we will adjourn this session. We will start promptly at 1.15. It's now 11.45 uh, to the committee. It's the time to get lunch and, and you and other guests, if they'd like to see this historic day, uh, hopefully uh, we'll see as much as possible between, our 12, between 12 and 1.15. We will start promptly. We have a, a briefing from the Department of Education, starting with the state superintendent. Uh, so I look forward to seeing people then. Thank you and we're adjourned.